we are ready to go. So it's a great pleasure to have Professor uh, Tommaso Macri with us. Thank you once again for accepting our invitation. It's an, um, I will try to give a brief intro to you. I, I got the information on your lattice. So Professor Tomato was born in Italy. Um, he got his PhD at University of Di Padova, correct me if I'm wrong, in Italy in 2011. Pretty young scientist. He, um, he got, um, I think he spent two years, as far as I could get, as a post a postdoctoral position in quantum science and technology in Arch Centre, Italy, and Max Planck Institute in Dresden. I think it was simultaneously, right? You commuted between these two places. Um, he got his position at Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, Natal, in 2015. Since then, he's been working in condensed matter system. Actually, he actually his PhD was already in condensed matter system, right? And and he will um, talk today to us about super strips and quasi crystals with hard soft corona interaction. So um, we are really happy to have you here, and we are eager uh, to see. Uh, what you have for us today, the, the mic is yours. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and of course, uh, uh, both to you and to George for the invitation. Uh, I hope you you can hear me right. You can hear me properly. Okay, great, great. Okay, so thanks again for the introduction. Uh, I, I I'm working at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. Um, uh, I started in uh, 2015 as a professor there. And uh, since then, uh, I was able uh, to, uh, thanks to the help of several funding agencies and my universe, my department uh, and the university, to build up uh, a group. Uh, today, we'll talk about uh, a work uh, that was done in collaboration with uh, Bruno Abreu, a uh, former uh, uh, PhD student at uh, Tony Campi. Now he moved uh, to the US. Uh, so when when we did the work, he was here in Natal, and then he moved to the US, and now he's working uh, in uh, Illinois. And Fabio Cinti was a professor at the, at the, in, in, in Italy at the University of Florence. As I was saying, I was, I, my group, uh, the people that, uh, that basically are part of my group uh, today are uh, Diego, who is now a, a professor in San Luis, Arsenio, Flavio, and uh, Vinicius, who are postdocs. Uh, two PhD students, uh, Igor and Daitor, and uh, uh, two undergraduate students, Artu, Artu and, and Caio. And for those of you who have never been to, to Natal, we are here at the tip of... Uh, uh, okay, we, uh, of course, I, I, I hope uh, that you know pretty well where Natal is, and this is the, our postcard, and I really uh, look for... I'm really looking forward for events to uh, be taking places uh, to be taking place very soon. We have uh, uh, some uh, which are still waiting for uh, the uh, finishing of the pandemic. So this has been postponed actually not to 2021, but 2022 on quantum simulation with the synthetic systems, which is uh, pretty much related to what I will be talking about today. And uh, uh, this other one, which is uh, uh, related more to uh, the, interfa uh, the interface of condensed matter hard and, and soft condensed matter physics uh, in collaboration with Fabio, one of the co-authors of, uh, of this work, and uh, Emanuela Zaccarelli and Primo Zierle from uh, Rome and uh, Ljubljana, uh, respectively. Uh, so guys, uh, well, uh, let's go to now to physics. Of course, uh, let me also tell you that uh, if you're interested to discuss with us, uh, at any moment we are available, just uh, get in touch uh, by sending, by dropping a note, uh, by dropping, me, dropping an email. Uh, I will be ha very happy to discuss uh, with any of you about uh, the contents of this talk uh, or the other things that we have been doing uh, 
we are currently doing uh, in our group. Okay, so uh, the basic uh, um, topic uh, that will uh, be covered today is related to uh, the issue of crystallization in uh, ultra cold uh, uh, systems, which is also one of the main objective or main uh, um, topics of interest for our group. So basically it's a sort of uh, the interface between uh, statistical physics, uh, atomic physics and condensed matter physics. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, by crystallization, I mean uh, the self-ordering of particles into an array with uh, regular geometry. And I will specify a little bit more in detail what I will be uh, talking about. Uh, so the, the prototypical example of crystallization in uh, condensed matter was uh, first provided by uh, Wigner, by Eugene Wigner, back in the 30s, who was considering the uh, physics of an electron gas uh, in the presence of a uniformly uh, positive uh, charged uh, background, which is of course provided by uh, ions, and instead uh, the electrons which are uh, negatively charged are interacting between themselves and uh, with the uh, ions. So the basic idea is to find uh, a configuration in terms of the typical densities of, of such systems, since for those systems you cannot in general very easily tune the interaction between them, between the particles, to understand whether there can be a sort of transition between a uniform fluid or uniform phase into a, a crystalline phase. In particular, in two dimensions, what you will expect is the presence or the formation of a triangular lattice. So what was found back then, by, thanks to the analysis of, uh, of Wigner, is that if you reduce the density, so basically if you increase the interparticle distance, you enter into a, what is nowadays called a Wigner crystalline phase, which again in two dimensions is just a triangular crystal. This type of uh, uh, physics uh, was uh, some sort of rediscovered or actually people started to get interested again very much, I would say, in the past, uh, over the past uh, 15 to 20 years, uh, mostly because uh, of the po new possibilities in terms of uh, experimental uh, challenges and uh, experimental platforms that are nowadays available. And one of the keywords that are, uh, that have been, that, I mean, it has to be used in this context to understand whether there can or cannot uh, be uh, such uh, structured uh, or pattern phases is the presence of uh, long range uh, interactions. So long range interactions in uh, typically in atomic systems uh, can be realized either with uh, polar molecules, uh, magnetic atoms, or for example, uh, Rydberg atoms. There are other setups like for example, atoms in cavities, uh, ions, or spin orbit coupled Bose-Einstein condensates where you can also investigate uh, uh, pattern phases. Let me mention just for a second, one of uh, the platforms that uh, uh, might be of inspiration for the things that I will be discussing uh, uh, further on. One of them is, uh, so this platform is provided by what are called the Rydberg atoms. So a Rydberg atom uh, is essentially, if you think uh, at, uh, about an alkali atom, so an alkali is essentially an atom where you just have one electron in the external shell of, uh, uh, of the electron shells that, you, that compose uh, the atom then uh, such electron can be excited to a state with a very high principal quantum number. In this case, we'll talk about uh, the formation of a Rydberg atom. So the nice thing about Rydberg atoms, they have several nice properties. One very important thing is the fact that they display very long range and very strong uh, interactions. And in particular, on top of that, you can also tune or, or basically engineer the type of interactions by properly exciting by uh, an external laser field, different types of uh, electronic states. So in this case, uh, so this uh, alpha and beta and gamma represent uh, single atom or single electron uh, quantum numbers or a collection of quantum numbers, like for example, the principal, the magnetic and the orbital quantum number. So if you excite, uh, for example, uh, pairs of states which are off resonant with respect to other uh, uh, pair states for the same pair of atoms, then you will typically find what are called Van der Waals interactions. If such pair states are resonant with other states, beta and gamma, 
then you will have uh, what is called the forced resonance, which is uh, a configuration in which that is extremely useful to understand and study, oops, and study uh, the physics of uh, uh, transport of excitations, not only in quantum system, but also in uh, biological systems. So this physics of forced resonance is really a uh, sort of uh, a mechanism that you can find uh, in several areas of physics. And then you can have uh, what are called the resonant dipole dipole interactions, which are the usual dipole dipole interactions that decay as a power law as one over R to the six. And on top of that, they are, they are also anisotropic. There is also another interesting mechanism that corresponds to a far off resonant uh, excitation that uh, uh, displays uh, that is called the Rydberg dressing. And uh, it allows uh, the possibility of engineering diff completely different types of interactions that uh, do not display these uh, hardcore constraints, like the dipole dipole or the van der Waals, for example, that basically diverge at the origin. So this means that when you take two particles and you make them closer and closer, basically the interaction, this interaction becomes more uh, stronger and stronger. Instead, for the dressing, uh, basically this interaction uh, converges to a constant, to a constant, or as it is said uh, uh, informally, it saturates. So it goes basically to a constant. So this means that you can essentially take two particles, and very uh, likely they can they would uh, uh, like to overlap within themselves. And I will show an example in a second of that. And all these uh, mechanisms that uh, we can basically um, understand very well in terms of uh, atomic physics processes find applications also to other uh, fields like for example quantum simulation of uh, exotic uh, hamiltonians quantum metrology or quantum information so uh, let me make a, a sort of step back to the uh, i would say the abc of uh, uh, condensed matter physics or many body phases in particular for what i what the, uh, what it has to do with the uh, bosonic systems. So particles, uh, I would say, are, which are other spinless or uh, with integer spin. So let's consider a bunch of particles, a set of particles, like uh, the ones that I'm showing here, that uh, interact via uh, pairwise potentials that, has, that, that have this uh, hard core uh, of, uh, uh, with radius of sigma zero. So this means that basically two particles cannot get closer than uh, this distance uh, uh, sigma zero. Instead, when they are farther than sigma zero, then basically they do, they do not interact. This system, as I said, is really the basic system that has been uh, studied since uh, the 50s. And uh, uh, what has been found is that uh, you can really write down, at least in two or also in three dimensions, in, you can write down uh, quite easily the equation of state. And this equation of state uh, is, is now written here in terms of a, a microscopic quantity, which is the so-called scattering length that uh, basically rules uh, the uh, low energy processes in uh, uh, quantum mechanics between uh, uh, two particles. The uh, dimensionless parameter here is the density times uh, a square. And what you can see here is the profile of the energy density as a function of uh, uh, this uh, uh, parameter n square. So it is interesting that uh, when you compare with the uh, uh, purely quantum Monte Carlo calculations, like these uh, white dots here, you find uh, basically a sort of uh, uh, end line or end point for this, for this uh, uh, curve that corresponds to the possibility, actually, to the presence of a, a transition from uh, a, a fluid phase, so a liquid phase, into a crystalline phase, which, as I said, already mentioned, is a sort of inner crystal uh, with uh, um, a pattern that is, uh, that is consistent with the triangular lattice. So when, then uh, what we can do is to try to basically slightly modify this interparticle potential and basically make it a soft core, or as I said, where, uh, as I mentioned, this can be realized with the, uh, with the platform like uh, Rydberg atoms. So as you see now, the potential basically has a typical radius, so sigma one, but now it is a constant from zero to uh, sigma one. So basically this would allow particles to overlap between themselves, a thing which is not possible, of course, with this type of potential. Now, uh, this type of uh, potential leads to a very rich uh, type of physics. In particular, at the very low temperatures, particles these bosons can uh, lead to superfluid phases. 
So this is actually the shape of a realistic potential, uh, which has the same uh, uh, characteristics or features of the previous one of the model potential. So it, it is flat for low interparticle distances, and then, and then it decays pretty fast as one over R to the six for large uh, distances. So at small uh, densities or interactions, then the system is in a fluid phase. It is a, actually a superfluid. But then uh, when you increase the interaction strength, uh, or the density, what you see is that particles start to bunch into droplets, and then, uh, but these particles can still, can still uh, um, talk to each other, or these droplets can still talk, so that you can sort of induce transport between these droplets, and therefore you can, uh, what you can say is that there is still a phase coherence, between, global phase coherence between these droplets, which leads to the possibility of observing what is called a super solid phase. If you increase even more interaction, you end up into a classical crystalline phase or classical uh, Wigner crystal of uh, uh, droplets. So you can do things a little bit more quantitative and try to uh, display at least or understand the phase diagram of this system by uh, performing uh, heavy path interval Monte Carlo calculations. This has been done from back, I mean, starting, the, starting in 2014. This, this, this is the result of our work. But then other people try to extend this work either in two in one dimension or in uh, three dimensions. And what you see here is the presence of uh, a nice strip of uh, super solid phases for intermediate densities and uh, interactions. So the nice thing is that, uh, in particular, close to integer filling, so this uh, here on the right side, on the right axis, you see the filling of each of the droplets that you, I was showing before. What you see is that if you go closer to this, uh, or try to induce, or to actually try to remove particles or add particles, the system uh, uh, starts to display some uh, finite uh, uh, superfluidity, which is consistent with a mechanism that was uh, first proposed by Andrea Blischitz and Chester back in the at the end of the 60s, which is uh, this mechanism is called the defect-induced uh, supersolidity. And this was actually in start, uh, initially proposed as a mechanism for a super solidity in, in uh, helium-4, but it was uh, certainly hard to observe. And uh, there are recent experiments uh, of the last of the past few, uh, I would say, five to ten years uh, by Kim and Chan uh, that basically uh, showed that in helium, uh, uh, this is not a source uh, of uh, uh, super solidity. So to be a little bit more specific by super solid, I mean, uh, is a shorthand for super, for super fluid solid, which means that uh, it is a system that displays both uh, solid-like uh, properties, which means that it displays uh, broken translation invariance, and at the same time, it is uh, super fluid, which means that uh, it can uh, uh, sustain persistent dissipationless uh, flow. This has to be contrasted, so this mechanism that the integer filling to what happens, what takes place at higher fillings or at higher densities. In this particular case, super solidity is not due to the presence of defects, so either by removing or adding particles, but uh, due to the uh, basically, okay, here it's uh, just the super fluidity as a function of the number of defects, which increases linearly. Uh, at high densities, uh, it, the super solid is compatible with uh, what is called a density wave super solid, which can be actually easily explained in terms of uh, uh, simple uh, mean field uh, uh, theories. So the mean field here is just uh, an extended or uh, uh, nonlinear uh, Schoening equation, which is uh, in this field is called the gross Pitayevsky equation. And what you see is that is the formation of uh, uh, patterns. Again, these droplets or clusters with many particles now that uh, are whose presence is somewhat stimulated by the presence by the uh, the presence in the excitation spectrum of what is called the roton minimum so you might be used probably with the excitation spectra of a spectrum of uh, a weakly interacting uh, bose gas for example which displays linear spectrum at very low momenta and then a quadratic spectrum at higher momenta Instead, if you have long range interactions, and this actually takes place not only for this specific potential, but also for other more strongly correlated systems, like for example, a liquid helium, 
what you will find is the presence of a maximum in the excitation and then a minimum. Now, this minimum here uh, gets more and more reduced, uh, so this, the height of this minimum, as soon as you crank up the interaction or the density of the system. Now, the presence of this roton is indicative of the possibility of having a first order phase transition because uh, once you reduce the height of this, uh, of this roton, then for the system it becomes more and more convenient to create excitations with a certain characteristic wavelength. Indeed, what you will find is that the uh, momentum or the characteristic momentum of this roton is actually associated to the inverse of the interparticle or the interdroplet distance. So the lattice constant uh, associated to this triangular lattice is actually related to the inverse of this uh, characteristic momentum of the roton. So these two features are actually very, very important. But again, uh, this density wave supersolid is very distant and very different from the, what you will find at very low, at lower densities. Tomasi, okay. yes. May I ask a quick question? Please, please, uh, Eduardo. You presented two views of the supersolid: one yeah. defect induced, and the other one more, you know, deriving from the rotons. Uh, yes. Is there an and how to how to say this? Is there an essential difference between these two picture two pictures, or is it just a qualitative a quantitative difference in the in the sense? Can can, can you could you for instance um, continuously yeah. go from one to the other, uh, or there is some parameter that has uh, some some sort of discontinuity from one to the other? Yes, let, let me maybe show you the directly the phase diagram of this system. Uh, sorry, here, maybe I can, uh, sorry for the, so the, the, the answer, I can start answering the question. Uh, the answer is that uh, uh, in principle, you can move uh, uh, through this phase diagram by changing uh, uh, continuously either the density or the interaction. But what you will see is that here, these uh, super solid lobes basically close so the essential difference is that at low densities, you will find uh, if you move, for example, along this uh, horizontal line at, uh, at integer filling, you will see a direct transition from a superfluid to a crystalline phase. Okay. So, so to be, uh, now, now you may ask, okay, but this, uh, uh, this is essentially the result, the output of uh, some numerical calculations. In terms of uh, microscopic mechanisms, uh, I would say both they can be understood in terms of the presence of a roton. So the roton is very generic uh, feature for uh, long range interactions. It is present. It is present, for example, as I said, in uh, liquid helium. So a, a system that certainly cannot be described by uh, by these very simple uh, uh, toy model potentials. Uh, the big difference is that instead, uh, here, if you go to higher densities, uh, what you will see is that even if you are at uh, integer filling, mm -hmm. then you, you have a, a, tra a transition from a superfluid to a super solid, and then from the super solid to the um, normal solid or Wigner crystal, which does not display any superfluidity. Uh, so the, the fact is that when you go higher in densities, then uh, you will recover somewhat the uh, a collective or global uh, coherence of the wave function. You can write down uh, what I showed here, a, a many body wave function where all the particles essentially populate the same single particle eigenstate. And this is the reason why you can write down essentially the uh, an extended uh, uh, gross pitayevsky equation. I would say this is this has been proposed initially by Gross. Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, uh, equation was proposed initially in, in the 50s by Gross, uh, uh, Eugene Gross, and Pitayevsky to describe helium. But uh, soon after, pe many people uh, observed that this is very crude approximation for helium mm -hmm. because uh, the inter the, um, helium is a very strongly correlated, strongly interacting uh, uh, system, and therefore you cannot really apply this uh, simplified picture. So the main difference between the two mechanisms is that the Andrea Lifshitz is able to describe, a, I would say, a strongly correlated, strongly interacting system. 
and instead the density wave super solid is very well suited for a higher density system where correlations are lower and uh, a mean field feature can be recovered in some sense. But do you, do you think you could tune from one to the, is it possible to tune continuously from one to the other by some theoretical parameter perhaps? Uh, uh, you mean uh, by theoretical parameter? What What do you mean precisely? Well, some, something, for instance, the form of the interactions or the density. Ah, ah sure, sure, sure. Well, what you see, oops, sorry, here, the, uh, I have yes, many Yes, you, you showed before. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, but I, I think No, no, is there a... is no problem. I, I would say that uh, the, the Andrea Lifshitz, you can find uh, around here. So. What you will have to do is that you, you sit at these uh, uh, commensurate points. Yes. Commensurate points. And then you start adding or removing particles. And this is indeed what I was showing here. So yes. if you add, add a number of defects, what you will see is that these defects start to basically delocalize. So sure. you will see these uh, green points here. They delocalize. Mm -hmm. And then they give rise to a finite yes. superfluid. And this is not the mechanism for higher densities. Sure, but, but you could go from one to the other, right? But you Continuous. can go. If you, if you increase here the number of, of particles, for example, in, along this axis here, in the lower panel, in the lower figure, then you will end up here, basically. Sure. You will end up into these uh, higher lobes. And, okay. there, and therefore, in this particular case, you will uh, be able to describe it uh, in terms right. of a mutual theory. Thank you. Thank but you. I, I think this is a sort of way to connect both, uh, sure, both sure. features. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, so what I want to do now is to basically try to match or actually combine these two inter part inter uh, pairwise potentials by basically taking uh, a, a two uh, length scale potentials where uh, sigma 0, the first length scale, is associated to the art core. And the second line scale is associated to the soft core. So there is, again, a soft core, but then you have a cut here, or you have an infinite uh, a potential or infinite barrier at uh, r equal to sigma 0. So certainly you cannot uh, expect a clustering. So you will not cannot expect particles to clusterize as much as we have seen in the case of the soft cores. But still, you can find some uh, uh, nice uh, pattern formation. And this is also actually expected from uh, uh, relatively recent investigations in the context of uh, soft matter. In soft matter, these potentials here, the ones that I was showing, are very popular to describe uh, interaction between uh, uh, biological systems like uh, micellis or uh, some sort of uh, extended polymers that can be a, 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 that can be effectively modeled as sort of uh, hardcore objects in, with the presence of a soft core or a soft corona uh, interaction uh, around them. So what you will see, what you saw, what we understood basically by looking at the literature of uh, classical uh, systems is that by increasing the interactions, you can find a much richer uh, series of patterns with respect to the uh, systems that we have just seen in the, in the quantum case for simpler uh, types of potentials. So what you will see here is the formation of it. Uh, you can go from a, a liquid to crystal, and then you will see you will start to see the formation of some uh, stripes or, or what are called uh, uh, labyrinth phases to end up into uh, what is called the quasi-crystalline phase. And if you play a, a, in a little bit more, if you look at in a more detail, um, to the kind of, of classical phases that you can obtain, that you can reach by tuning the ratios of these two length scales, sigma one and sigma with respect to sigma zero, what you will see is a very rich uh, a pattern of uh, quasi-crystalline phases. And these were investigated really a lot. These are just two uh, references by 2014 and 15, uh, but there are many more uh, actually in the past uh, uh, five to six years. So. Before going on, let me just uh, spend a word about quasicrystals. So quasicrystals are essentially uh, regular uh, systems, but but with or regular patterns which are not periodic. So as you might might probably know uh, from uh, standard condensed matter physics, uh, you see, you know that in there are in uh, um, 
Uh, if you look at the patterns that you can form with the regular geometry, either in two or three dimensions, you can uh, you are constrained by crystallography to either two, three, four, and six-fold uh, symmetries. And higher order symmetries, like for example, uh, five and seven-fold uh, symmetries are actually forbidden. This uh, uh, paradigm basically changed when uh, Dan Shekman and collaborators observed uh, the formation of uh, a, um, what, what is nowadays called a quasi-crystal with the five-fold uh, symmetry. And the first ob observation was uh, uh, basically reported in, the, in this PRL in 1984. And uh, it soon uh, became clear that the uh, structures that they were observing were actually related to some other mathematical objects that were introduced uh, uh, some uh, time before by people like uh, Roger Penrose, that was uh, that won the Nobel Prize uh, uh, last year, so it was it was the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics for, uh, of course, other discoveries. But uh, the nice thing is that now uh, what we would like to do is try to understand is that if there is uh, some microscopic mechanism in terms of uh, two particle of, or pairwise interactions, whether uh, that can give rise to the formation of uh, uh, quasi crystals at sufficiently uh, low temperatures. Now, this uh, uh, question actually has been uh, tackled in several uh, directions by uh, different groups. So, for example, quasi crystals in uh, Bose Einstein condensates were proposed uh, by, by, by Daimler uh, from Harvard in 2013, uh, and other people uh, from uh, the US, uh, again, uh, by, uh, by looking at the superfluid quasi crystal in Bose Einstein condensate by using uh, what are called spin orbit couplings. Uh, between different internal levels of uh, uh, atomic systems. You can actually induce uh, quasi-crystals by applying an external uh, non-periodic potential or quasi-periodic potential. And this uh, is, is, has been realized by the groups of Ulrich, Ulrich Schneider in Cambridge and David Well in, uh, in Santa Barbara in the US. You can also look um, at quasi-crystals for uh, multi-scale soft core uh, potentials very similar to uh, the soft cores that we were talking about, and I will mention this paper in a second. I will show one of the motivations uh, that uh, uh, might be interesting for us in a second related to this work. And then you can also obtain, uh, you can actually try to obtain a quasi crystals from uh, super radiant phase transitions in uh, multiple cavities. And so this is actually related to a different field, which is cavity uh, QED. So the, uh, one of the reasons that I was talking about uh, that work, so this uh, PRB 2020, is the possibility of, observe, of observing cluster quasi-crystals. So this clusterization is again due to the fact that, that we have uh, potentials which uh, basically are constant when uh, or do not uh, diverge when you try to put uh, two particles sufficiently close, close by. This mechanism actually of clusterization is, as I said, very well known. Uh, you can already obtain it uh, via standard soft core interactions. So with the, the help of, the, of that step potential. But here, what is it? It is interesting is that uh, you can, inc by including uh, a larger or complex structure to the uh, pairwise potential by the addition or by multiplying essentially Gaussian potential times uh, a polynomial you can end up with a, a series of uh, uh, multiple minimas in the Fourier transform of the potential that basically are associated to that, uh, ex those excitation spectra that display multiple now uh, roton uh, excitations. And therefore, when you have uh, many competing length scales at which your system would like to be excited, it is more probable it is more probable, more likely for the system to actually end up into a, stru into a structure which is non-periodic. And this is actually a snapshot of the Monte Carlo calculation that was uh, uh, provided in this paper. Now, the theoretical question that, was, that they tried to answer the, uh, last year was uh, the possibility of observing quasi-crystals uh, at fine temperature. And indeed, this is what they find. So if you look here at the uh, axis, uh, which are this uh, rescale temperature and this the Bohr parameter lambda, you end, you end up seeing that uh, actually quasi-crystallinity 
appears only at uh, finite temperatures. Instead, if you reduce the temperature, you end up into a solid or a super solid or eventually uh, for large, for small densities, a superfluid phase. Now, the question that we wanted to address was whether we can actually try to reduce this uh, uh, critical temperature for the uh, observation of uh, quasi-crystalline structures back to uh, zero temperature. So, of course, we need uh, different types of type of mechanism. And the way in which we envisioned this mechanism was to use uh, those uh, uh, hard soft corona interactions that I was mentioning a couple of minutes ago. So the potential that we uh, consider is again due is again composed of this uh, hardcore potential, hardcore uh, corona, uh, which with radius sigma zero, then a soft core that we parameterize by this parameter epsilon here, which is a dimensional parameter, uh, from sigma zero to sigma one, and then a vanishing potential for particles that uh, are sufficiently far from each other. We employ what a MEC method, which is called the path integral Monte Carlo uh, method, with the help of the so-called work algorithm that uh, allows us to uh, basically uh, calculate or compute the superfluid fraction of the system. And we, of course, uh, have to work uh, with the finite size systems. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, we will not be able, uh, uh, basically, to uh, simulate in a, in a reasonable amount of time uh, all uh, the phase diagram or the relevant uh, features of uh, uh, this system at finite density and a finite interaction strength. So what we observe here is the presence of uh, different phases by, uh, for example, fixing the interaction and uh, cranking up uh, the density of the system. So we start from a superfluid phase, uh, then we cross this transition into a triangular crystal, then we have some metastability, and finally we enter a strike phase, a labyrinth, a Kagome lattice, and then uh, for higher densities, we end up into a triangular crystal. So all these features can be understood by plotting, for example, the radial distribution function, or even uh, the uh, snapshots of uh, our quantum Monte Carlo uh, calculations. Now, there is a, another interesting uh, feature that I want to mention is the fact that if you compare uh, classical and quantum simulations, at uh, the same temperature, what we'll find is that uh, quantum fluctuations actually play a relevant role, at least uh, in some parts of the phase diagram. So, for example, if you look uh, at the special, at the particular value of uh, the density 0 0.2.227, then what you will find is that classically you would expect essentially a sort of disordered phase or somewhat a labyrinth phase. Uh, it is a sort of metastable labyrinth phase, I would say. Instead, in the quantum case, you will see very nice uh, uh, stripes. And again, this can only be understood in terms of the presence of uh, uh, quantum, can be quantified uh, by looking at uh, quantum fluctuations in our system. The other interesting thing uh, is the fact that, that the system can display uh, superfluidity only in a, a specific part or in a, in a limited region of the phase diagram. So what we see here is that by moving along this uh, uh, line here, so by increasing the density, what we find is that uh, the system initially is a uh, superfluid uh, with the value which is compatible with the unitary superfluidity, which is what is, would be actually expected uh, from a very low temperature superfluid. And then uh, when, you enter, when we enter the triangular crystal, the system is not superfluid anymore. So there is no super solidity. And finally, when we end up into the stripe phase, we see that stripes are indeed uh, superfluid, and superfluid is inosotropic, which means that uh, if you move along the directions of the stripe, then the particles like to exchange between them, and uh, in particular, transport is uh, enhanced along the direction of the stripes. Instead, if you move uh, uh, perpendicularly to the direction of the stripes, the system basically displays a very small uh, superfluidity. So you can certainly talk about uh, super stripes in this case, in the sense that you have superfluid stripes, but then uh, when you increase even more the, the, the density of the system and you end up into the either the Kagome or uh, the triangular lattice, the system is not uh, superfluid anymore. Then another interesting feature is that by uh, properly tuning uh, 
the uh, ratio between uh, the uh, two length scales of the microscopic potential to a specific value, which is 1.95, what you will find is essentially a very nice transition from the standard triangular class, uh, crystal at very high densities into what is called either a sigma phase or a true quasi-crystalline phase. So actually, since we are working with a finite system, the sigma phase, which is uh, uh, what is called the periodic approximant of uh, a true quasi-crystalline phase, is always dominant because, of course, we have to uh, basically simulate our system in a finite box. But still, uh, both phases, uh, both the sigma phase and the triangular uh, square triangular random tiling, which is a specific type of quasi-crystal, is uh, as an energy which is smaller than the corresponding uh, triangular crystal, which is which are which is represented here by these uh, black uh, squares. So how is this uh, uh, quasi-crystal actually formed at uh, high densities? Well, uh, the specific quasi-crystal that we are talking about is a 12-fold uh, quasi-crystal, so it has a 12-fold uh, symmetry, which is well represented by these uh, 12 peaks in the Fourier transform of uh, the uh, path inter Monte Carlo snapshot here of the density of the system. And this can be built uh, uh, mathematically as a tiling, which means that uh, is essentially you can tile all the plane without leaving any space in between the tilings or the prototypes, which in this case are both, which are either squares or triangles, in the following way. So you can start uh, plotting a central point, then you start adding. A, a six, uh, sorry, a, a regular hexagon around uh, the central point, and then uh, you add uh, a, a dodecagon, a regular dodecagon around uh, this uh, uh, hexagon here. Now, how do we actually fill uh, uh, the system, this uh, plane with the sides of our uh, quasi-crystal? So we first uh, build, uh, we actually plot a set of uh, dodecagons around each of the sites that we have, the blue sites that we have just shown here. And then we have some sort of arbitrary uh, or a way to uh, fill the empty, empty space with additional sites in order to make a full tiling in terms of square and triangles. How, we, how can we uh, tile these this, uh, blank spaces? Well, we can create, we can add hexagons and these hexagons actually can be either an hexagon with this particular pattern or just rotated by 30 degrees, one with respect to the other. How do we choose to fill these blank spaces with hexagons? Well, we choose it randomly. That's why it is called a random tiling. So we, we will see that in principle you have a very high entropic state because you will have really a huge number of uh, degenerate states due to the fact that you have random uh, choices for uh, uh, filling these hexagons. And then you can indeed find several types of patterns because you will see that you see that if you now join these four uh, points, these two uh, red points with these two green, you will have a square. Instead, uh, here you will see that if you join these two red points with this uh, green point, you will have a triangle. And that's why, and you can actually see that uh, if you try to, uh, to make this very simple exercise, you can only find either uh, triangles, uh, um, uh, equilateral triangles, or uh, uh, squares. You can actually be a little, more, bit, little bit more quantitative to understand the phases of uh, at high densities by computing what is called the bond orientation order, which is a, a generalization of uh, what is called an exotic order parameter. The exotic order parameter or this bond rotation order basically tells you how order are pairs of edges of uh, the pattern that you're looking at. So suppose that you would take a single vertex. This vertex is connected to two nearest neighbors. And then uh, you can form the, um, you can look at the edges and at the angle between these two edges. So this angle, the angle between the two edges is theta B, uh, theta uh, B the angle, and uh, nu is uh, the uh, ordering, uh, is an integer that can either be 3, 6, uh, 4, uh, 5, etc., which is actually, uh, I mean, uh, it's an arbitrary integer number, 
And then what you will see is that you can take the average value of this parameter with respect to the configuration of the ground state that you are actually reaching with your Patintel and Monte Carlo calculation. So what we see here is that for small, for high densities, but still smaller than the uh, highest ones that we can reach, you will, we will see that the exotic order parameter or the uh, case in which the bond ordered, ordered bond rotation order is computed for nu equal to six is dominant. Instead, when you increase the, intra, when you increase the density, the 12-fold uh, ordering is actually dominant. So this is actually another indication of the fact that the ground state is either in a sigma phase or in square triangle uh, random tiling. Instead, if you try to test uh, this uh, bond orientation ordering for different values of nu, then you will find that they will, they will all be flat and very close to, to zero. Okay, so uh, another interesting thing, okay, you can actually make a cross check by computing uh, the potential energy associated to each one of the configurations. And again, you will see that uh, at larger densities, uh, the uh, sigma phase uh, is dominant with respect to the square triangular random tiling for, finite, for a finite cell system. And is, but then both of them are much uh, lower in energy than the triangular crystal. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, the message that I wanted to convey during this presentation is that uh, you can find uh, a very nice interplay uh, between uh, uh, quantum fluctuations and uh, uh, crystallization by looking at specific uh, uh, tailored pairwise uh, uh, interparticle potentials. We have, of course, uh, tried to look at uh, the simplest case of bosons, but uh, it has to be expected that very nice patterns can arise also if you uh, look at uh, fermionic systems. And this is actually some sort of perspective for our work uh, in the next future. And to be more specific, what I showed is that uh, by looking at uh, uh, soft core potential, you can end up into nice uh, triangular uh, supersolid uh, phases. Instead, if you go to larger densities or and more uh, complex types of potential, like for example, the hard soft corona interactions, you can end up uh, into uh, what are called either sigma phases or quasi crystalline uh, lattices. And with this, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, your attention. And of course, I am open for questions uh, if you have uh, any. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, Tommaso. Nice talk. Um, uh, the, the, the section is open for questions. The water is I, ready I can, I, to ask. Can I ask another question? Sure, sure. No, please. It, so uh, one of the things that um, uh, your talk, well, first of all, it's amazing this thing you show because you know, so many phases and, and, and different orderings and it, it's really amazing, it's truly amazing. Um, now, uh, let me ask about the following. I mean, uh, in several points in your talk, uh, I was reminded of this mechanism that's called order by disorder. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a situation in which either quantum or thermal fluctuations actually favor the appearance of a, some type of ordering instead of the other way around, which is what you usually expect. So yeah. uh, I actually, the, 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 the slide that they are showing right now is, is, is illustrative of that. For instance, yeah. on the left, um, uh, it looks like the quantum, <laughs> Solid is more uh, has a more uh, more of a of an order than the left classical one. So that's yep. one case where it reminded me of. And also the, your explanation for this uh, quasi crystal on the high entropy of configurations that seem seem to be at the basis of this uh, quasi crystalline order also seems to suggest that. Have you ever considered this? Is it something that you can quantify? Um, or am I just not? It, it is. A, it is. A, it's certainly something that you can quantify. The simplest case would be this uh, one on the left, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, because classically, when you run, uh, I mean, I think you can actually, in this particular case, try to 
do also some analytical calculations, I'm pretty sure. Um, at least a sort of mean field like uh, calculations uh, should be available. But the interesting thing is that classically, basically, if you think about the classical partition function of a bunch of particles, then uh, you, what is important there is just the potential energy. Because yes. the kinetic energy actually gets factorized because uh, you get sure. the prefactor in the partition function. In the quantum case, of course, the kinetic and the potential do not commute, and that's uh, the origin of, uh, again, quantum fluctuations. So what one, one could look at is uh, actually the uh, value of uh, kinetic energy in the case of quantum uh, of the quantum phases. And this is a, a pretty high because, and also it's sort of counterintuitive to when you talk to many colleagues, it's, it's I would say it's quite counterintuitive for, for the following reason. Uh, because uh, in quantum mechanics, when you try to basically localize a particle, mm -hmm. the localization induces stronger uh, kinetic energies. So th this is the opposite of what you would, what you would expect classically because classically from actual Boltzmann distribution, you, would, you know that the temperature is associated to the kinetic energy, to the motion. So I, I think there is some, some noise, probably, Edson, if you can... Yeah, it's not here, I think. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah, oh, you can. Okay. okay, no, 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 it's... So, so, in quant so classically, you would expect that uh, the more you localize, the lower the kinetic energy. Uh, and this is the, the basic idea of why you, you have... Uh, uh, I mean, temperature is a good uh, parameter uh, to describe uh, microscopically your quantum phases. Instead, uh, your, your classical phases. In quantum mechanics, you have to take into consider to considerations the localization length of the particles. And this is precisely one of the cases. So you try to localize more by creating stripes. You increase the kinetic energy, so you have strong quantum fluctuations. But at the end, uh, it is more convenient for the particles to basically order than just make being totally disordered. So one way I would say to compute quantum fluctuations for, I mean, at least quality, it's not probably the most quantitative way to parameter, but it's just looking at the kinetic energy. And this is also what we have done for the right, for the quasi crystals, for example. Nice. Um, but the nice thing is that quasi crystal what what they showed is that you can also find the classical quasi crystals. Yes, okay. But the, the difference is that you, there they are due to entropy. Uh, you were talking about the entropy. This is precisely what happens because uh, when you come when you have, if you have in mind the structure of the free energy, which is made by energy internal energy minus T times uh, the the temperature times the times the entropy. So it might happen that uh, if you are at finite temperature. The larger the entropy, the 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 lower will be the free energy. Free energy, absolutely, it, yeah. So so that that's why I was saying that it can be either thermally uh, driven order yes. by disorder or quantum driven order by disorder, and exactly. there are different mechanisms, but they sometimes have the same effect. In, in the exactly, end. exactly. Yeah. Quantum yeah. fluctuation, I would say, in this case, it's much trickier to understand to to, quantum, to be more quantitative, but. Uh, that's why we, we try to use uh, these numerical techniques that allow us to, to address these points. Okay, thank you. It's beautiful. Thank, thank you. you. Any, other, any other question? What, why are people thinking about that question? I can make my own. Um, uh, nice, very nice figure, nice result. So, but my question, uh, maybe, you know, to have explained already what I needed. So in, the, in your calculation, uh, is this essentially boson, right? You consider boson, bosonic particles? Yeah, yes. So the perspective, you, you talk about Fermi, but this is for future problems. Um, yeah. But your, your, your particle does not have internal degrees of freedom, does Sorry, right? I, I, didn't, I didn't get so, the, the question. So if you're asking if the particles have internal degrees of freedom. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Okay, but no, very nice question. Very nice question. Um, so in our case, uh, uh, particles, so the the way in which we write down the Hamiltonian, maybe I can just show the, the Hamiltonian uh, here. Yes, uh, yes, here. Uh, so here you see that the basically you have an Hamiltonian which is uh, made of uh, kinetic energy, kinetic term, mm -hmm. square over 2m, 
plus uh, a just an interaction, pairwise interaction. So you have interaction between pairs mm -hmm. of particles only. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the, the question is interesting because uh, one may ask, okay, but look, you have these nice uh, toy model potentials. How can you engineer these toy model potential? And to engineer these toy model potentials, you need uh, uh, to play with the internal degrees of freedom of uh, the atoms, if you wish. So in particular with the electronic, I mean, by addressing some very specific electronic structures, which have uh, very specific electronic um, type of interactions, et cetera. Uh, the, 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 um, the message is that, okay, as an atomic physicist, you have to play with that in order to create or to simulate those potentials. But once you have done that part, then you end up with a, a potential which basically disregard completely the internal structure of the particles. And this is a quite a very good approximation. It's a sort of, uh, I would say, a paradigm for people that work in this uh, quantum technology um, type of, types of applications in particular to quantum simulation, which is one of the research areas of uh, quantum technology. The, uh, now, the, the, other the other possible way to answer this question is what could happen if you really take into account other internal degrees of freedom. And um, this is extremely interesting because you can think about, for example, adding uh, some uh, coupling between two internal states, like a sort of spin orbit coupling or Rabi coupling. Uh, you can have um, uh, the fact that uh, you you can already um, observe by just putting spin orbit coupling, for example, is the presence of uh, stripes, stripe phases. And this you can see it, uh, I, I think, both in electronic materials, so in really with fermionic systems, but also with the bosonic systems. And with bosons, I can tell you, they, are also, they have also been observed. So... Um, and but now the, the ingredient the, the, we are talking about actually two different things. So the mechanism that we wanted to play with is by playing with the interactions. So the mm -hmm. idea to to obtain pattern phases with interaction is to use uh, non-local interactions. If you use contact interactions, you cannot observe uh, uh, patterns. You typically have a, a direct transition from uh, a fluid to a Wigner crystal for very high uh, densities. If you want to obtain patterns, again, you have two ways. One is to include no locality or long range, to be clear, or to add the internal structure, which is the other mechanism that we were talking about right now. What, what, what about the spin? I mean, the spin one, for instance, since you are interested in bosons. Boson yeah, so cycle. it's, a, again, a very good question. So uh, in, with these systems, you can talk about either true spin or with the, you can talk about pseudo spin. So when I was talking about uh, coupling internal states, uh, in that case, I was talking about pseudo spin. So when you address more than one internal level, that's a sort of pseudo spin. So you can have uh, also uh, bosons with uh, a pseudo spin one alpha. So which means basically that you have two internal states that you are coupling. Instead, when we talk true spin, uh, the, the, the spin of the atom basically, and that has to do with the isotope that you are working with. So, mm -hmm. of course, if we have uh, an atom with uh, a pay, even number of uh, uh, neutrons, then it is a boson. Instead, it is a, it, otherwise it is a fermion. And uh, the reason why it is easier to use bosons is that uh, at below a certain critical temperature, they condense. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they are, I mean, you can uh, already start with a pure genuine, genuine quantum system uh, that display in, in general superfluidity and other very nice uh, quantum effects. With fermions, typically the problem is that to really go quantum, you have to go to much lower temperatures. Uh, so a temperature which are the order of a fraction of the Fermi temperature, to be clear. And this is uh, maybe easy to reach with the electronic materials, but then you lose a tunability of some other parameters. Instead, if you want to work with atomic physics system, uh, then uh, to reach uh, uh, these degenerate temperatures, it is a little bit trickier. And to control them is a little bit harder. But certainly this is a direction. And one thing that we are actually looking at is to look at these uh, fermionic systems now in, in lattices uh, to understand a little bit more of, this, of the physics of these non-local interactions. Uh, um,
in a better way. Thank you. Any other questions? You have time for some. Oh, they're silent. Do I don't have any further questions? Yeah, may, maybe regarding spin, uh, I think that's yeah. a, a very important point. Uh, what about the solid phase? Because in, for instance, in, in helium-3 fermionic system, the solid phase, uh, the, the spin plays a very large uh, part because you, in, this, in, the, in the Fermi liquid or superfluid phase, it's basically quenched. Uh, and it doesn't play much role, but once you freeze it into a solid, then you you, you have this very large entropy of spin. And I, I imagine that if you have a spin one boson uh, crystal, uh, it might have the same kinds of effect. Is it is it correct or not? This is a good question. I really don't know because. Uh, mm, so the the idea, okay. Depends because the systems are very uh, very different energy scales, uh, length scales. Uh, so this system that I was uh, I, that I have in mind and typically uh, are uh, easier to to play with are ultra dilute systems, which means that the density is uh, really orders of magnitude lower than helium or real condensed matter systems. Uh, so this is a very important thing to to consider. Um, so when we talk about solid phases. In these materials, they are always metastable, or both the liquid and the, the solid phases are always metastable because, of course, if you take a piece of uh, of rubidium, it is a solid, so it is form of molecules basically. So uh, you start creating molecules and then you start crystallize. crystallize. The system uh, and, and of course the typical landscapes in, for a true rubidium uh, metal or a compound is are of the order of uh, uh, Armstrong. So basically, you are typical uh, distances which are of uh, atomic lattices. In this case, we are talking about distances which are uh, typically of the order of uh, hundreds of uh, uh, nanometers. So because they are, I mean, you are playing with um, uh, laser couplings and uh, optical uh, lasers, of course, work at optical length waves. Uh, which are hundreds of nanometers. So we are really talking about system with very different length scales and very sure. different properties. So this solid phase that I'm talking about are of course extremely fragile. Um, when you, we talk about spin again, in particular, either both spin, true spin or pseudo spin, then uh, I would say it depend, really depends on the quantum phase that we are talking about. For example, the stripe phase, that I was showing is a very fragile. So a very small perturbation would lead to the formation of disordered phases like the labyrinth or the um, or a fluid phase. Uh, the Kagome mm -hmm. is even worse. So I, I, I think, yes, I'm showing here the Kagome uh, phase, yeah. for example. Yeah, it's precisely the Kagome I was going to, <laughs> to mention that in terms of, because if, if you have a solid then and you're left with spin degrees of freedom, of course, they're going to have to find some way to relieve the entropy that they have, and usually by some kind of ordering. And the Kagome lattice is famous for being the most frustrated two-dimensional lattice for spins. And, and even the classical system is badly understood. Uh, so, you know, if... if yeah. No, I know what you're be, talking about. Yeah, that might be no, very no. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it would be extremely interesting, but uh, so here there is a, an important point, uh, which of course we, we take it for granted when we study, for example, magnetism, right? So in, in particular, we, we always neglect the fact that uh, all these crystals in real life are basically uh, self-formed. So it's sort of either stable or metastable state, but it's basically due to the fact that uh, atoms have, have, have very complex interactions and then it is stable, it is uh, more likely for them to form these crystals. So here it is precisely the same mechanism. So because we take uh, two body interactions and then we expect them to start uh, clustering in some way or to aggregating uh, in a way that they form these structures. But again, uh, these structures are very fragile. Now, if you want to add uh, 
uh, spins, it's not guaranteed that, for example, you can localize a spin yeah. at certain site uh, of uh, of uh, the Kagome pattern that we were talking about. You might have uh, particles also in between the uh, these uh, like I'm saying the valleys between two lattice sites. So it's very much comp much more complex uh, system. Yeah, One I thing that would be that interesting would be sort of other other type of types of ordering, like for example, nematic ordering. If you have a pseudo spin one, you can look at the formation of crystalline phase or breaking of traditional symmetry and the formation of a nematic order in the sure. pseudo spin. That also is something that uh, is very cool and certain. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that just like with the spin zero bosons that you have, you have so such rich phase diagram. I'm sure if you put spin in, it's going to be. Uh, a yeah. huge mass as well. I mean, <laughs> you have to do it. You, you can't predict, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There are people that work with that, but typically they work with the uh, contact interactions uh, because it's easier to work with that. Uh, otherwise, you increase uh, really the number of parameters and it gets really messy. Okay, thank you, Tommaso. Yeah, you're welcome, Eduardo. Any, any other another question? No, but I, I'm I'm afraid I still have some, but I, I'll make my last one. Have you looked into the transport pro, pro, um, uh, properties of this system? For instance, I would uh, I would expect uh, very different properties in the different phase. For instance, the superfluid should be uh, I would be more interested on. I would say, have you have you looked into that? Well, if you want, uh, uh, superfluidity is already a sort of transport property because the superfluidity is related to the um, uh, possibility of having a dissipationless flow. So mm -hmm. typical experiments with the helium are, are the so-called torsional experiments, which means that you have a, a sort of a system that you can uh, basically rotate with a certain angular velocity, or you can just uh, play like this with uh, periodic uh, motion and try to see if the fluid basically goes with the container or uh, or not. Uh, you can also try in these uh, uh, kind of atomic system uh, um, platforms. What you can do is also to put uh, sort of an impurity and try to move the impurity to uh, mm -hmm. in the middle of the system, basically, through the system. And uh, superfluidity in this picture is associated to a criterion which is called Landau criterion for superfluidity. And this is nice because it's also related to the um, excitation spectra that I was talk that I was showing at the beginning. Um, so transport uh, is actually you can see a transport in different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. The way in which it is best uh, decided for bosonic systems is uh, via the uh, superfluid uh, fraction. I, I think there is a background. Uh, Okay, thank, thanks, Ed. Um, so the best parameter that you can look at in bosonic system are, is, uh, is the superfluid fraction that you can both uh, uh, compute numerically. It's harder to measure. There are ways, um, but it's quite hard. But nevertheless, I would say that's the parameter that you can, you can look at. Other, the other thing is to try to put impurities in the system. You can study the, the formation of... Uh, Actually, the the transport pro properties of um, of impurities, I would say, that's a possibility. But we didn't we didn't look at, at impurities. We just computed the superfluid fraction. All right. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the noise. At some point, no one could hear me because my microphone was too uh, too bad. Now you can hear everything. So sorry <laughs> about that. <That's laughs> any any other question from the audience? Uh, I, I think not people agree quite close. Tanya was uh, asking a question at the beginning. Yes, sure yes, yes, I was. Uh, and provoking. No, the, the, the point I was interested in is exactly the one you were discussing for, for a few minutes ago. So all the questions okay. I, I had, you already made about electrons and spins and fermions. So you, you, you were faster than me, actually. Okay, Tony. Thanks. All right. So, but indeed, it, uh, it was it was really interesting talk and very clear, 
and uh, I understood much more about solids and this, those, those super solids and all that. Good, good. If there is no Great. other question, uh, let let us thank the speaker again. So now it's hard to hear clapping hands. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you very much.